Hey guys, I'm Elizabeth McCravey, a website designer and business coach for entrepreneurs and your host for the Breakthrough Brand Podcast, the show that's all about pulling back the curtain on how to actually build a successful business. I don't skim the surface around here. If you want a deep dive into the nitty gritty details of what it takes to run a successful business and stand out in a crowd, you're in the right place. After creating a multiple six figure a year website design business in my 20s, I'm ready to share everything I've learned and everything I'm still learning because I believe the keys to building a thriving business should never be a secret. Here you'll find episodes that are actionable, direct, and fun, like French chatting business over coffee and a fresh, honest take on the reality of being an entrepreneur. If you're ready to master online marketing, branding, website design, mindset, and business strategy, then this is the podcast for you. It's time to build your breakthrough brand. Let's do this. All right, welcome back to the podcast, friend. I hope you loved last week's episode with part one of all this real estate talk. If you missed that one, go back and listen before this one. That's episode 134, or at the very least, listen to it after. You can technically listen to this one first because we're tackling all kinds of different questions. But last week was a bit more foundational into like getting started in real estate. And we're kind of doing a bit more like nuanced stuff on this one. So to give you a little peek into what we're talking about today, we're going to talk about how much money do you need up front to get into real estate? Do you have to do 20% down? Why or why not? We talk about why we went with rental properties versus doing flips and some different thoughts there that can help you make like a decision for yourself on that. Uh, We talk about how we found the properties, like what what way you go about doing that of like even getting started in that step, what cash flow we're getting from the three properties and what we expect there, how do we expect that to grow, different expenses, things like that. We talk about property management companies, which is such an interesting conversation there. Like, are do we have one? Do we not? Or are we managing ourselves? and why or why not. So definitely some good stuff there. We talk a lot about how to screen your tenants to make sure you get really great people living in your rentals and our decision to do three properties basically back to back to back and why we went with it that way. What were some challenges and different elements of that happening? So I hope you love this and I hope this helps you in whatever stage you are in the real estate process, whether you're just thinking about doing this, you're like, huh, that sounds interesting. I'm intrigued. Maybe you're intrigued after last week. Or if you already are in real estate or already like working towards your first property, whatever it is, I hope you get so much from this. And as always, I'd love to hear your feedback over on Instagram. I'm at Elizabeth McCravey. I know Adam would also love to hear what you guys are thinking of these episodes. So feel free to reach out, share this on your stories, share this with a friend. If you have someone who you're like, oh my gosh, this would totally help them please share it. Yeah. And without further ado, here is this conversation again, continuing the real estate talk with my husband, Adam. All right. So we are back today with part two of all these questions about real estate. And I have Adam here with me again. Hey, I'm back. (laughs) If you missed the first episode, definitely go back and listen to that one. But you could also listen to this one without that one, because really the topics are all just so different, but they do build on each other a little bit. And for reference, if you did miss the last one, we're talking about just our own experience investing in real estate as non pros at this three properties that we bought within the last year, all long term rentals with tenants in all of them now, and all in middle Tennessee area. So that's kind of what we're talking about, how we learned all that and and different questions you guys had about how to do this stuff. So I'm going to jump right in. The first question we're going to talk about, how much money should you have up front when investing in rental properties? Do you need 20% down for an investment property, which is a great question. Yeah, the simple answer is yes. You are probably going to need 20% down if you're doing a a normal mortgage through a bank. Obviously, for your personal residence, they'll normally allow other types of loans that don't require 20% down payment for investments, at least recently in the history of banking, they want to see 20%. That's also a best practice for you as the investor because that gives you a nice equity cushion. Like you're starting off with 20% equity in the house, which here's what that allows. It allows a, a market downturn to not make you upside down on your mortgage, which upside down your mortgage, think back to 2008 housing crisis. That's where you owe more money 
on the property than you can sell it for. Like the the outstanding balance of your mortgage is larger than what would happen if you just sold the house. This is what can happen when a market goes way south, right? Which hopefully we don't experience anything like that. But that's a really bad situation because then you can't even pay off the mortgage even when you sell the house. Okay, if you're starting out with 20% equity in the house, it is extremely unlikely that you could end up in that situation, even if the market experiences a really rough period. So banks want it. It's also good for that reason. Now, let's say you don't have 20% for the down payment. One great option is to bring in a partner, you know, split it 50-50. The other person brings 10% for the down payment. You bring 10%. You guys work out a contract with a real estate attorney on how you're going to divide up the work, but then the profits just get split 50-50. So that's one way you can get around needing 20% when you don't have it all yourself. There's also a bunch of other ways. So later, I think on this episode or maybe the next episode, we're going to talk about a book that was really helpful to us. Literally half the book is devoted to ways to come up with the money that you need. So we'll talk about that here in a minute. Yeah. So great answer. Totally agree with that. And one thought I had that I feel like goes along with this that more so almost is something you might run into. For a lot of you listening who are business owners who run businesses that are maybe confusing to someone who is a mortgage lender is that it can be hard to get a loan as an entrepreneur and claiming your income when you do something weird. So some funny things that happened to us with the first property in particular, it got better after the first one. We, We switched lenders actually. But but with the first one, they wanted to call my business's phone number, like the number listed for my business, which I do not have a number listed for my business because it would be my cell phone. I do not want that to be listed. But they wanted to call it and talk to an employee to verify with the employee that it was a legitimate business. So I'm like having to explain like that's not going to be able to happen. They also needed an active contract with an existing current client that I was like doing a website for, which I also didn't have at the time because I didn't have any one-on-one clients I was working with at the moment. I was working on my course. Um, You know, I sell website templates. So I'm like, I can give you an invoice for someone who bought a template recently. I ended up giving them my contract with Rick Mulready that had like ended not that long ago. And they thought that was fine. And then I had to write a document and I was supposed to have a bookkeeper or accountant sign it, which I think they, I think Madison did it or Don ended up helping with that. But I had to have a document explaining all my different business names, each one, when it changed, why it changed and prove that they were all in fact the same company. So it was just like weird stuff like that. Like they totally were confused by what I even did for a living and definitely maybe thought we were shady. I don't know, but might have to have have some um, hurdles to prove your business is real, basically. So yeah, it's a process, but I mean, it's possible. Like it, it just they ask for a lot of legwork. Yeah, which yeah, it's totally possible, obviously. Okay, yeah. So next question, I would love to know why you picked rentals versus doing a flip. Adam, you want to talk about that? Interrupting this episode with a suggestion for the small business owners listening. Ever wonder what you should do for healthcare when you and your spouse are both self-employed so there's no work-provided health insurance to participate in? Well, when my husband Adam joined me in the entrepreneurial job space over four years ago, we joined Christian Healthcare Ministries instead of getting traditional health insurance. And it was the best decision for us, especially in these years of growing and raising a family while also running multiple businesses. CHM is a health cost sharing ministry and is a faith-based alternative to health insurance. We did tons of research before choosing CHM. And if you know me and Adam, you know, we are all about doing the math when making big or small financial decisions. And even though it's not insurance, CHM shares 100% of eligible medical bills, which is more than the typical 70 or 80% of medical bills paid for by insurance companies. All sharing is determined by the CHM guidelines, which you can check out before and after joining. And for the mamas and mamas to be listening, you truly cannot find a better healthcare option for maternity care. I had a vaginal delivery and a C-section and birth center care and hospital care 
somewhere between my two pregnancies and births, and it was all 100% shared for. And outside of birth, we've had our share of emergency room visits and procedures as a family, and those costs were all shared by members at Christian Healthcare Ministries, leaving us only paying our monthly contribution. CHM is less expensive month-to-month than insurance, and because there's no network, you can choose your care with whichever providers best fit your family. I seriously just cannot recommend Christian Healthcare Ministries enough. You've got to check them out. Go to elizabethmccravey.com slash chm for more information. Also putting that link in the show notes, elizabethmccravey.com slash chm. Now back to the episode. Yeah. Okay. Well, first, there's nothing wrong with flips. I mean, that's a great strategy and plenty of people out there make plenty of money doing it. So nothing wrong with flips. Our personal opinion and preferences. Flips are risky. And I've gotten, uh, you know, I know people personally who have done flips and I've seen through their experience like, man, sometimes it goes really well and you make fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in a pretty short amount of time, which sounds amazing. But sometimes it goes bad and you don't make any money or maybe you're even concerned about losing money. Again, because it is a more complex process, there's more that can go wrong, right? Like you can get an estimate on how much contractors are going to charge you to do all the work that you need done. But if you've ever worked with a contractor, you understand that it is just that an estimate and it almost always comes in higher than whatever you were estimating. So a lot of different things that can go wrong. However, doesn't mean it's a bad strategy, just means that there really is risk. The other part of the answer is really just dictated by our age. Like we are in our 20s, which means we are in a position to be able to play the long game. Like, I don't need to make the money now fast because we're 28. I got time on my side. So rather than doing a flip and working really, really hard for like six months and hopefully in the best case scenario making 50 or $60,000 or maybe 70, who knows, and then I have to go out and do it again. And then I have to do it again. And then I have to do it again. To me, at my age, that sounds worse. And it sounds way better to buy a solid rental property with great numbers and then hold it for a decade or more the entire time watching the value appreciating. Also, the entire time watching the rent go up, think about how much more I'm going to be able to rent these same properties for 10 or 12 years from now. Double? Double seems like it's in the bag, like maybe triple, like especially as if you follow the news much, like as we begin to grapple with the reality of inflation increasing in America, that only drives up rents more, right? So I'm watching the the property value go up. I'm watching the rents go up. So the profit margins are only getting better over time. And I'm watching the loan get paid off, right? All the while, I'm making anywhere from six to $12,000 a year in profit from the rents every single year. Not something I have to do over and over and over again like a flip. And then in 10 years, you know, depending on how much it's appreciated, you're going to sell that thing and you're going to make a lot of money, potentially even a couple hundred thousand dollars, depending on how much it appreciated during that time. And then you get to divide that right into three or four different properties. I mean, if you make $200,000 off of that sale, boom, you just turned that one property and, and you took the money out of it and spread it across three other properties. And now that's exponential growth. And you're doing that in your mid or late thirties in our case. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that whole scenario that I just played out is built on the concept of having time. I totally understand a person who Maybe if they're a little bit older, they're on the second half of their career being more drawn to flips because they don't have the time. They need the money up front. But at least if you're young, I see a lot of upside to the long term rental. Yeah, which Adam's dad and stepmom are actually into flipping. They also have some long term rentals, but they yeah they do both, and they do short term rentals. Yeah, they have a yeah they have a short term rental, so they're doing it all. And they also re- got into it like about the same time we did, which is interesting. But they um, have had both some really great flip experiences and somewhere they lost money and could not get anyone to buy it because it was like a bad purchase where the like fixes didn't really make anyone interested in it. And so we've heard a lot from them on that. And yeah, I don't know. I personally don't really feel interested in flips. It's just like how I feel about it. But like it's even just, long term. It's a lot of things. work. I mean, 
I think flips are a really good thing if someone is trying to be a full-time real estate investor. But if you're trying to do this somewhat passively as a side project to your actual life and career, oh man, flips is a lot of work. Like that could be difficult, but people do it. Yeah. So that's why for us, but yeah, if you're, if flips sound like super fun and exciting to you, like that could be a great thing for you too. Okay. Next question. Would love to know how you found your properties and how you are planning to finance them. How much are you going to cash flow from each? I mean, someone else sent a question saying, how much profit do you think you'll be able to make from them? Okay. So to answer that first part about how we found the properties. So we worked with a really awesome realtor. Who's also a friend of ours who also listens to this podcast. I'm pretty sure she'll probably listen to this episode, but her name is Sarah Clark of Baccarosa, and she's an awesome realtor. So she was the main way. Yeah, really, that, that was kind of the whole answer on how we found the properties. There are a lot of creative strategies, like dozens that people have come up with for finding properties. We didn't do any of those. We were just working with a realtor and everything came straight off the MLS, you know, and we were looking on realtor.com and Zillow and stuff like that and send in properties back and forth with our realtor, but uh, nothing super creative there. But yes, Sarah Clark, Baccarosa was excellent to work with. If you're looking for a realtor (laughs) in Middle Tennessee, she's great. Yeah, a lot of looking on like the realtor.com, Zillow, those kinds of websites, and then like sending her properties, going and looking at them. Again, Adam did all of that. I did not even look at any properties with her until after we bought them. And it was like, hey, let's go look at it now that you own this. Yeah, you slackered. What were you doing? (laughs) Growing a baby or something? (laughs) Yeah, so that's the answer to that part of it. And then as far as the cash flow, they're all profiting right at around 12%. One of them might be more like 11 and one might be more like 13, but all three of them are right around 12%. And again, when we say that, we're talking about the month over month profit from the rent minus all of your expenses, your mortgage, your property tax, your HOA, if you're a part of an association, whatever else to get the lawn taken care of, whatever utilities you as the landlord are responsible for. So when I say they're profiting 12%, I am talking about cash flow for whoever out there use the right term. I'm talking about the profit being made every month from the rent check after all expenses are paid out. There are other ways that we're making money. Again, we talked about this in detail in the first episode. The property is also appreciating. You're also paying off the loan. So when you factor those two in very conservatively, very conservatively, you're looking at a 15% return at least. And and honestly, probably a lot more than that, but we'll just go with the really conservative number. Now, Again, for people out there who who like the stock market, and I like the stock market, we love the stock market. Like, you know, retirement. Love the stock market. Love the stock market. Look at it all the time. I think it's very entertaining. Over the history of the stock market, depending on how you run the numbers, most people agree it's averaged about a 9% return. Some would say eight, some would say 10, nine is pretty average, which is great. Like, that's worth doing. But really quickly, you can see how real estate can go way past that and even double it quite conservatively speaking. So that's my pitch for why I think that this is a good place to invest your money. Yeah. And I mean, I'm trying to, I'm about to try to look up the the episode number, but if, if some episodes back, let me look real quick. So on episode 127 of this podcast, so just scroll back some, I talk about ways my business makes money and the three additional ways we make money in our personal lives. One of them is real estate, which we are talking about today. But like Adam was saying, the stock market is also awesome and we do stuff there too. Yeah. Hot take. You heard it here first. The stock market (laughs) is a good thing. Information you did not know. Also, just for a side note here, Adam, before we start recording this, brought a sandwich in here and just finished eating it. And it makes me really sad and jealous in a way that does not make sense because it's just a boring turkey sandwich. But I have not had deli meat since being pregnant. And I always said for a few times, which I ate a bite of his just now. But it just, it was like the best thing I'd ever tasted. And it was a four out of 10 of a sandwich. <laughs> it looked amazing. Literally I'm, didn't even have lunch. And I haven't lunch. even had lunch. Where's my lunch? You brought yourself lunch, but not me. So here we are. I'm sorry. I, know, I didn't really want lunch yet. But anyway, okay. So that was, yeah, so that's that one. Financing, cash flow, all of that. Okay, next question. This is a good one. I'm wondering if you are planning to hire a management company or deal with issues yourselves. And then someone else phrased it. Are you planning to be the landlord and maintenance person? Or are you hiring that part out? Or maybe it depends on the work that's needed. 
So we have had people help do like so with repair. Here, you you start actually. You explain what we're doing. We're, we're explain doing it. almost everything ourselves. So self management. We are the property manager, the landlord, the first contact. We have hired contractors for a couple of things. I literally think two. Had to hire some people to do some HVAC stuff because I don't know anything about an HVAC and had to hire a company to do painting on the second property like we talked about in our episode last time. And and it's not honestly because we couldn't do it ourselves, but just because when you're talking about painting every single room in a house, that's just so much time and the price really wasn't that bad. So it just made sense. Other than those two purchases, everything else we've done ourselves, like all the, you know, couple dozen little handyman type fixes at this point, did all that ourselves, watched YouTube videos, figured it out. And yes, all of the normal property management roles we're playing ourselves. As far as why? Well, we have the time right now. And I say we, I'm talking about me, like not having a time consuming career. Like I'm in grad school right now and I have an assistant position at MTSU and all that does take up time, but it's not overly demanding. So I have some margin. So it's a good season of life for me to do this stuff myself. I'm also excited about it. Like I want to learn how to do these things. It's been a fun learning experience, but I think we'll try to self-manage as long as possible. Like even after I'm through grad school and, and a licensed counselor and working a full load of clients, I will still try to manage these properties myself as long as I can for two reasons. One, I think you can. I mean, I haven't talked to any of our tenants in quite a while. Like, it's really not that much work most of the time. When you're only talking about three properties, four properties, five properties, whatever, I really do think that that can be a side project to most people's careers. Like, if it's in your geographic area, now, obviously, it's a totally different thing if you're investing somewhere at distance, but if it's in your area... It's really not a lot of work, and I think it can be an added-on project to your to your other responsibilities. You'll save money. Property management companies are, are going to charge you at least 10%, so boom, that really eats into the profit margin. And they also just have a bad reputation. Property, I mean, just think about it. If something breaks and you need to go out and hire a contractor, if you're doing that work, you're going to read reviews on Google. You're going to make sure this person does good work. You're going to price shop. You're going to compare. You're going to make sure that you get the right person to help you. A property manager will do none of that. Like they are going to do whatever the fastest, easiest thing is. They're probably going to pay too much and they're going to pass that bill along to you and not care. And with our Adam's dad and stepmom, they've done property managers for some of theirs. I had a really bad experience in, with one in Atlanta. They live in a different place, but like they're an example to us of that as well. Right. And it it just makes sense. I mean, it's you are going to care about this more than anyone else. And you outsourcing that work to a third party is is going to be a loss in some ways. So I would try to avoid that as long as possible. And at least when you're talking about long term rentals in your area, close to your house, only a few of them. I really think that that can be somebody's side project for a while. Yes. And one thing we have talked about for whenever it becomes where it's like, okay, we don't like when Adam is working full time as a counselor, when our baby's here and I'm working full time, all that, like eventually we still would not do the like, okay, we're here's a property manager company. But we've talked about finding someone who would be interested in being like the first contact for all the properties at a like set monthly rate where some months it's like, hey, you might not have anything to do. And some months it might be like, hey, there's a lot of work here. And having someone be like that point person a little bit between us. Yeah, absolutely. I I think that we could, if we could find the right person who is young and would like the extra money and maybe doesn't have a family and it would just be an additional thing on top of their career, Mm -hmm. we just teach them how to do exactly what I've been doing, right? Kind of this DIY property manager, and uh, it could be a really good thing. Yeah, so that's a great question. Okay, this one's also a really great question. How do you plan to screen tenants? And then this person said, we have several older friends that have had some really bad tenants that kind of left a bad taste in our mouths as far as dipping our toes into the market. 
So, Adam, you want to talk about this since you've been the one? You, I mean, I, again, going back to like how Adam's done more of this, I actually have not met any of our tenants. I've gotten them gifts. I know their names. <laughs> I know what Adam says about them, but I haven't met any of them. But you've done a lot of that, so talk about that. Yeah, this is really important. I mean, we've only been at this for about six months, but I've definitely already seen and experienced firsthand that the tenant has such an impact on how passive or active this investment is. Like if it's a tenant who is awesome and they don't really ever bother you about anything, they don't break anything, they're not overly needy or high maintenance, they just pay their rent and go about their way. Okay, now we're talking about a passive investment. Great, I'm only going to think about you once a month when I get your rent check. And other than that, I never think about you. Versus another type of tenant who is... That sounds so mean. <laughs> I never think about you. Well... He I, means like you're not creating problems yeah, I mean, for us. I mean, you're not we a to-do list. Yes, item. we do think about her. <laughs> yes, think about them as a person <laughs> okay, who is valuable. Clarify that. <laughs> yes. Like, but going. not in a to-do list kind of way. Yes. But then there's an, another type of tenant who is higher maintenance, who is always going to be finding a, a reason to text you. Okay, I'm, th- I'm trying to think of a good example. Like, I had a tenant one time who did not have hot water, right? That's a problem. They're turning their water on, and it's cold water. They can't get hot water to turn on. So they text me. Okay, they haven't done anything wrong there. Like, that makes sense. They don't have hot water, so they, they text their property manager. Okay, the issue was that the breaker box switch that gave power to the hot water heater was off and needed to be flipped on. Another type of tenant probably would have figured that out themselves before they texted me as the property manager. That's what I'm talking about. Those are the two types of people that I'm talking about. It's not that the one who texts me is a bad tenant. They're just a little bit higher maintenance. So these are just small examples of how the type of person who's living in these properties will have a big effect on how much this is truly a passive investment for you or not. Well, and another, just to add on to that for you going, like the how well they take care of the property is also a huge element Absolutely. of that because they can literally decrease the value of your property, cause you to have to repaint it or redo floors or redo carpet or whatever when you would not otherwise have to. So having someone who really cares about where they live, like being nice is also going to be helpful because then they're going to take better care of it. So, which we have, like, I think we have a mixture in that between our three different tenants. But, like, our one of our tenants in particular, like, she literally was asking about, like, retouching paint herself because that's how much she was, like, caring about it, like, looking amazing. And she saw this as her home and that kind of mindset. So that's helpful to have. Absolutely, yeah. And, and for our tenants right now, we have three. Two of them I think are excellent. One of them is good. Not a bad tenant at all. I don't think we have a bad tenant. Nobody is like wrecking the property and not paying their rent. We have one tenant who maybe is a little bit less what Elizabeth just described, like doesn't seem as much like invested in this as her home. That's okay. To answer the original question, so far all we said is that the quality of tenant is very, very important. As far as how you make sure you have a, a good one, just be really patient. I mean, again, we only started doing this six months ago, and we've already had a couple of times when we had to pass on someone who wanted to live in the property because they weren't the right person. Whether their credit score told us that or just talking with them and general intuition, like we've already had to do that, I guess, two out of the three different properties we've had to, to not go with the first person who filled out an application. Which can feel hard because you feel guilty a little bit. I remember I felt guilty on one of the, the people because I was like I, wanted, like, I wanted them to be able to live there, but then it was like, didn't make sense. Right, yeah, and that, and that can be difficult, but it doesn't mean that it's not the right decision. So it's worth it to be a little bit patient and a little bit picky and maybe not jump at the first person who wants to live there so that you get someone in there that, that's really going to be great to your place and... Uh, and set everyone up for a good experience. Now, just something really specific as far as how you screen a tenant, it's a product called My Smart Move. If you just Google My Smart Move, you'll find their website. They have a paid version, but if you're just doing a few properties like we are, you can use the free version. It's a software that will allow you to run credit scores and background checks. It's very straightforward and very simple. So we use that with anyone who wants to fill out an application. Yeah, that's it. Anything else on that one? 
No. Okay. At some point, we should talk about security deposits and what to do if you want to take someone who has low credit, but maybe that's a different question. Oh, that's, a, that's a big topic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this next one's really short. Someone asked, are you furnishing your rental properties? The answer is no. If they were Airbnbs, we would, but since they're long-term rentals, people don't want that. But I do think that sounds fun. I'm like, hey, I'd furnish something. <laughs> yes. that, sounds, that sounds exciting. A future product that's, or project that sounds like a blast. Yeah. So whatever we do, because we, I mean, we said this on the last episode, but we do have interest in doing Airbnb type properties eventually. I especially have interest in one that would be a vacation home for us as well. So I would be like, I'm going to make this look like what I want to look like, you know? Yeah. So, th- so that's the answer there. Next question. I would love to know how you decide to go for two properties right away, which we actually went for three right away, but at the time we had not. Um, we have gone back and forth about whether to just do one or two. So do you want me to answer this one? Yeah. You take a crack at it and then I'll okay. fill it in. Yeah. So we did not, yeah, the thought is, I mean, I don't know. We didn't really decide. We were not like, oh, we're buying three properties this year. It was like more cohesive, not cohesive. That's not the right word. Intuitive, maybe. It, yeah, just feeling flow. Our way it, it just more like happened. We knew roughly how much we wanted to put down on the first one, going back to like that 20%. And we were not putting down all the money we had to invest into one property. Again, we talked about that in the first episode of like, we have mortgages on these. We believe that is the better way to do it. Adam showed you some numbers on the last episode for why that makes more sense. And so it was like, okay, what are we going to do with this other money we have to invest? And we decided to keep investing in real estate. So you don't have to decide up front to do two or three or whatever number. And I would say, as you are deciding, though, if you're not sure, regardless, it's smart not to put all the money you have to invest into one property. But even if you were to just do one, get a mortgage on it. And if you have extra extra money to invest somewhere else, you could go into do stock market investments, put some money in cryptocurrency, (laughs) do another property, something like that. So yeah, I think I don't know that I have too much more to add. Like it wasn't a firm upfront decision. It was more of a oh, wow, okay, we did one that went well, that seemed to all our numbers are working out that seemed to go how we thought it would go. Let's try another one. The only thought that I would add as to why we did kind of try to do three boom, 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 really thinking about inflation, again, to be to be clear, not an economist, not a financial advisor, not even like an investment guru, just a person over here (laughs) like you. But from my view, it does seem like inflation has already started to become a reality And it seems very possible that it's going to get worse before it gets better. So, you know, simple economics, if inflation is happening and going to happen, cash is really bad. I mean, the basic idea of inflation is that a dollar is losing value in terms of what it can buy. What used to cost $10 yesterday, it costs $12 today. That's inflation. So, Inflation is really complicated. I don't claim to know everything about it, but I do understand that in that kind of context, you don't want to sit on a lot of cash. The buying power of your dollars is shrinking. So we kind of moved pretty quickly through three different properties from that mindset of, okay, we've, we've got some cash on hand. We don't want to have it as cash. We want to get it into some kind of asset that will appreciate with the rest of the economy not a pile of dollars in a bank that will shrink with inflation. Yes. And that if you did not hear that, clearly rewind it, because that's really important to understand and think about with this. Yeah. Then, I mean, one more thing to add here. I'm trying to remember, we already had a tenant in the first one when we bought the second, right? And then so on. Oh, yeah. The, The bank would not give us a loan until we could show that a tenant was in the first property. Yeah. So it wasn't like we we didn't buy three like in a week and then be like, all right, now we got to find tenants. It was more like we did one and kind of like you're looking for the second one while we have the first one listed. And they all went pretty quickly. It's actually interesting. So the final... The final property, we did a little bit higher on the rent than maybe we thought. Well, I thought I was the one pushing us to go higher, actually, Mm -hmm. on all of them. Um, Let's let's try a little higher. But we tried for a little higher on the third property, and so it set a little longer than the others. The other ones, like our first property went so fast, like, because people really wanted it. Right, and we could could have priced it a little bit higher. And, you know, it was our first one. We didn't know as much. And we also just wanted to get somebody in there fast. Yeah. 
And when we say that the last one set longer, we're talking about like 10 days, which was longer than the, the first property for sure, but not long enough to, to be a considerable amount of lost income. Yeah. And one thought too, just as we're saying all this, that something we learned the hard way I could, you could say, a we, I was really excited to do a business credit card because I'm all about putting things on a credit card as a business owner and making that cash back money. And there's a lot of my favorite credit card. I'll link to it in the show notes, but it's the Spark Capital One. I think that's the, the full name of it, like cash back card. And they have a really awesome promo where you can get $500 as a bonus when you spend a certain amount in the first three months. And it has a really great cash back just always. But we applied to that and actually didn't get approved because our business had no, nothing to show for it. But then that like dinged us that we were trying to get credit and mess stuff up with the later properties. You're like, why are y'all trying to get, like it makes, it doesn't look good to a lender. So you should wait on that. Yeah, When you're in the process of getting approved for a loan, you do not want to open or close lines of credit. Like yeah. you kind of just want things to remain stable. Yeah. Which we were able to explain that pretty quickly. And when we didn't get approved, we were like, okay, we're not going to like keep applying. And then once we were done with all three was when we applied and got approved. And now we have that credit card. But yeah, okay. So we have a little bit more time in this episode. Do you want to talk about the security deposit thing you were saying or no? Sure, no, we can talk about it. So earlier we talked about tenants and how important it is to try to get the right tenant and different ways to go about doing that. Credit scores is a big one, right? Like that's kind of a baseline, like run a credit score on a potential tenant. And if it's a really bad credit score, then that's probably not a good tenant for your property. And if it's a really great credit score, then that's probably a green light. Let's say it's somewhere in the middle, like it's a bad credit score, but it's not horrible. And there's some other things that you really like about this tenant and you want to find a way to rent the property to them. In that event, one thing that you can do is just ask for a higher security deposit. So just another piece of information, we've been doing one month's rent as the security deposit, which is very simple and straightforward. None of our tenants have had an issue with that. It seems very normal. Whenever we've had a tenant who maybe their their credit score was a little on the low side, but we still wanted to rent the property to them, uh, I guess we did that with one tenant. We just increased the security deposit, like asking them to put down two months of rent in advance instead of one. And here's what that's doing. It if a person has a low credit score, what does that mean? They've had a problematic history when it comes to paying money back. So what are you worried about as their landlord? You're worried about a possibility where they, they stiff you on rent, like they don't pay the rent and you never get it, right? Well, if they're giving you two months of a, a two months rent as a security deposit, you have a lot of insulation, right? Like you're two months paid in advance, so even if they just completely miss a payment and never pay it and you have to evict them or something like that. You got your money and then another month. So you just got a lot of protection there. The other way that it's giving you cushion is let's say they're really rough on the house. Like let's say they just break that refrigerator and that a bummer, right? Like that's exactly what you don't want in a tenant. But if you've got the higher security deposit, well, you're holding you know, two and a half or three grand of their money. So if they do somehow mess up the property, you've got some insurance, so to speak. Just a little strategy you can use. Yeah, very helpful. Okay, that's it for this episode. So that was, that was a lot of good questions again. So we have one more next week. If you're listening to this later, you can go ahead and listen to it like after these originally aired. And then if you did listen to this one before listening to last week's, go back to it because a lot of those questions were a bit more like foundational questions to how things were set up. We talked about doing into business with your spouse, finding properties. I can't even remember what all we talked about. Yeah, it was about, a little more of an introduction. Yeah. So definitely go back to that one. And then there'll be another episode next week. And if you have questions about it, feel free to message me on Instagram. I'll be sure to like share something that you can comment on this week and we can talk about this more. But yeah, that's it. Okay. Next time. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast and all the way until the end. I appreciate you being here. And hey, if you enjoyed this episode, then I want to encourage you to check out my website where you'll find tons of resources to help you grow a profitable and sustainable business. 
Over on elizabethmccravey.com, you'll find free workbooks to help you figure out things like the best headline for your sales page. There's a freebie with my favorite journal prompts to start your day with, a guide on website essentials for all you coaches, and so much more. And you'll find my top business tools. Yes, I literally list out all the major ones for you on my website. And there are tons of special discounts and offers for you guys to snag as you try these products and services. You'll also find the main ways to work with me. First, through my Show It website template shop that helps you DIY your way to a strategic website for your business. These website templates are easy to use. They're gorgeously designed and they have all the strategy I'm teaching on this podcast just woven into them. And I have a feeling you'll really love them. You'll also find my course and coaching program for designers, Booked Out Designer. In this program, I teach you everything I did to build an in-demand design business so that you can create a thriving business for yourself as a brand or website designer. So with all of that interests you, go to elizabethmccravey.com to access those tools and free downloads. Head to the tools page at elizabethmccravey.com slash tools. And to see the different ways to work with me, simply click over to the ways to work together page. I hope you have so much fun exploring everything over there. And don't forget that you can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening so that you never miss an episode and leaving a rating and review for the show, um, sharing it with a friend, sharing it on social media are all great ways for you to support this podcast. Thanks so much. And I'll see you again next week.